sehr herzlich und sehr kurz begrüße ich Sie im Namen des Goethe-Instituts und unseres Institutsleiters, Herrn Dr. Blömecke, zu unserem Nachmittagspanel Dealing with the Past. Wir sind hier in einem Gebäude, das fast 50 Jahre die Botschaft der DDR beherbergt hat. Auch das gehört zum Thema. Ich wünsche Ihnen eine herausfordernde Diskussion zu dem Thema, das in Deutschland der Nachwendezeit immer noch eines der wichtigsten ist. Vielen Dank. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, allow me to greet you also on behalf of the civic organization politicalprisoners.eu. Uh, um, when we are uh, composing this panel uh, in the spring this year, together with the Forum 2000 uh, conference organizers and together with the Office of the Government of the Czech Republic, uh, we were in a very uh, difficult situation as a country. And uh, by this I mean the situation about the interpretation of recent past, which was in the hands of the Institute for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes. Uh, I will not go into many details, but just to underline what I really mean, uh, allow me to quote the economist from the 22nd April uh, of this year, which just uh, wrote, including the interim director now in charge, it has had five directors in six years. In 2010, four different directors led the institute. We are still talking about the Institute of the Study of Totalitarian Regimes in the Czech Republic. And then the economist goes on. The relatively late creation of the Ustr, which is the abbreviation of the institute, 19 years after the fall of the communist regime is in stark contrast to how some other post-communist states dealt with their past. The former East Germany, for example, allowed citizens to access security service archives in short order. The relative silence in then Czechoslovakia's immediate past, communist years allowed people with ties to the former regime to gain influential positions in business and politics, some making a seamless transition from Marxist ideologue to crusading capitalist. End of quote. Uh, I hope uh, you all understand that I'm not pushing any opinion by this. I only want to give a food for thought for the discussion that we have in front of us and because there is no uh, much time ahead. I don't want to bother you with further opening remarks. I only want to thank very much the Rigeta Institute uh, for the opportunity of organizing the whole event uh, in their premises. I want to thank the Office of the Government for uh, collaborating with us on this uh, wonderful discussion. Of course, same thanks goes to Forum 2000. And now allow me to welcome uh, here, I wouldn't say on the panel, but on the floor next to the panel, uh, Mr. Pavel Tichtel, who uh, came to us from the European Commission and who is um, uh, partly uh, re um, uh, who is partly responsible, sorry for that, for the Active European Remembrance Program. Mr. Tichtel, thank you that you arrived and the floor is yours. Thank you. I'll, I made some notes, but it's kind of difficult to juggle the two, so I will try to use my memory or the fragments of my memory. Uh, uh, I come from the European Commission. The European Commission is referred to often as the engine of the European integration, but I think the European officials, and I hope to, I'll be able to demonstrate that, also can use their brains. So I will today speak, let's say, not so much on behalf of the European uh, Commission, although as well, but uh, a little bit to talk uh, more from the perspective of somebody who is working with the issue of remembrance for a number of years and who has a personal interest also in the issues of uh, history and remembrance. I know I don't have a lot of time, so I will just stick to my main points. But uh, I would like to start, if, if you allow me, because I think that demonstrates what I'm going to say uh, by a short story. This is a real story. This is a story from uh, summer of uh, this year. We usually spend uh, months uh, to five weeks in the Czech Republic, uh, coming from Brussels with the whole family. We travel through the country. Uh, well, okay. And uh, uh, this uh, year I was visiting a place where my mother was born. Uh, she spent her childhood there. I wasn't really much, I didn't know much about the place. I didn't really visit it very often. But uh, before going to the place, I uh, read about the history. And uh, I learned that there was a synagogue somewhere in the center of the town. This is a very small town 
uh, about uh, 100 kilometers from Prague, maybe a little bit less. So I asked my mother where the synagogue was. She had no idea. She said, well, I don't know. We had to ask some relative and said, okay, I know uh, the synagogue is right in the center of the town, basically. It's a small town, you have the church, you have uh, a few shops, then you have uh, the synagogue. You go to the synagogue, but the streets that leads to the synagogue is not called uh, a synagogue street or anything like that. It's called the cinema street. This, this sounds a little bit strange. So then I was looking on the internet what was the history of the synagogue. And uh, if you look at the history, you see that this was built in uh, the mid-19th century. In 1942, the synagogue becomes a Protestant church, and in uh, 1968, it becomes a cinema. In the 1990s, it becomes an empty shell, and uh, it's just there, kind of falling into ruins. So what does this uh, little example demonstrate? I think, first of all, it demonstrates, when we talk about memory and remembrance, uh, that memory and remembrance is very selective, and it is uh, also very, it could be sometimes, very misleading, because if I ask my mother what the building was, she would tell me it was a cinema. Uh, if I ask my grandmother what the building was, she would probably say, well, it was a Protestant church. And if I wanted to know why the building was built, I would have nobody to ask, because there are no Jews living in uh, uh, this town. They were all killed during the Holocaust, mostly. Uh, so that's my first point. The memory is very selective. You have to look at it. There is also an issue if we talk about the nation and the memory of nation. Uh, we have the question, what is the nation and what is the memory of nation? Because we have so many significant changes in this part of Europe. And we're dealing with the problem when the protagonist of some of the most dramatic events are no longer there. We have no chance to ask them, what is your memory? What do you think about these events? If I draw a parallel with the Holocaust, uh, somebody raised the point and said that the main issue with the Holocaust is that we cannot really understand what happened there because there's nobody who came out of the uh, gas chambers. There's nobody to ask. So that's the one thing. Uh, the, the second point is, and this leads me to, to my conclusion also, uh, the second point is that uh, if we look at the uh, history and remembrance, we can't, I think, understand history by elimination. We cannot say, and there also you can see the parallel with what happened in, I think, in Western Europe after the war, and in Germany after the war, uh, that uh, the society tried to understand uh, the, the Nazi period and what happened during the war as something which was a deviation, which was a digression from a normal course of the society. So they would refer to Hitler and Nazis as mad, people who were not uh, without the, uh, within the uh, normal norms of the society something that happened by some coincidence or something the mad people who uh, terrorized the society into the submission. And it took a long time, I think the process still goes on, until the society started to realize that we cannot understand the memory and remembrance until we start asking the real questions. We start asking how is it that there was a strong support for the regime? How is it that until the end of the war, that there still were people who were supporting the regime until the bitter end. And I think there is the same parallel we can draw with communism, because we can see that uh, uh, sometimes there is also the same tendency to externalize the, what happened in, 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 in the, the, the communist Europe, to say, well, this was a result of an aggression. We had a Soviet aggression. They brought this regime. It has nothing to do with us. Uh, there's a second uh, explanation which says, well, you know, it was brought to us and then there was the secret, aid, uh, secret service and they terrorized the society to the submission. People were opposed from the beginning, but they had no choice because they would end up in a prison camp or in a labor camp. But we know it's, it is more complicated th than that. We know again that in many countries, including this country, there was a very strong support for the uh, communist regime at the beginning and almost to the end. Huh? And now I'm coming to the conclusion of my... Uh, uh, of my uh, introduction, I think we cannot understand what happened during communism and what happened during Nazism until we try to understand what happened in this small Czech town where the synagogue becomes in 1942 a Protestant church. It becomes a cinema in the 1960s and it's left empty these days uh, to fall into, in, into rain. Thank you for attention and I'll, I'll be here so I would be also very happy to uh, then engage in a further debate. Thank you. Thank you.
Pavel, thank you very much for that. And if I could just add my words of appreciation to the Goethe Institute for hosting this this afternoon, and of course to Tomasz and his organization for having assembled it in the first place. These are critically important issues. Um, the future is premised on our understanding of ourselves and our sense of who we are is a function of our understanding of our history. And that is true in every society, that is true in every community. So the issue that we're going to try and grapple with this afternoon is one of critical importance. And I think it's even more important to recognize there are no perfect answers. Somewhere between amnesia and agony lies learning. And it is only if we can learn from the past that we can deal with the past. But that is much, much easier to say than it is to do with any degree of success. So we have on the panel this afternoon four extremely experienced and very insightful people who will give us country and personal perspectives in respect of this particular challenge. And I'm going to take, if I may, take you in order from left to right. Uh, that's simply the way that I found the name tags on the table, so there was no selection in respect of this. Um, so can I t turn firstly to Matis Vedvesky um, from the nation, National or Nations Memory Institute of Slovakia in order to offer a perspective from where you are? Uh, dear Mr. Chair, dear colleagues, thank you very much for me being here. Well, when I was wondering about these topics, as it, this is of course a bit of my work to you know wonder and think, so I would. I would agree with what you said. There are generally no good ways. There are ways we have to try. Uh, so when it goes for uh, uh, kind of general recommendation, it's, well, no, no recommendation is perfect and no reconciliation is never to be achieved in full. You can never satisfy any, everybody, but uh, my opinion is that we have to try to satisfy at least um, as many people as possible. I mean, there are some ways that we, for example, in Slovakia or former Czechoslovakia and in other countries that we went through. First of all, the most important was real what happened in the early 1990s, uh, and it was the rehabilitation of you know political prisoners, you know, trying to compensate for the past injustice. That was what was really happening. Uh, but, <clears throat> and that was what was really necessary. Uh, but after that, there are some more steps, in my opinion, that are necessary to, uh, for a society, for, and for our, hist for us historians, that are necessary to take. Uh, and in my opinion, it is, the historical research that is one of the most important steps, you know, uh, in, a, in a way or on a path when you are trying to, you know, put the burden of the past behind or try to deal with it somehow. Uh, because, you know, in my opinion, it is the science that is really affecting the future, not only I mean, not only natural science, not only uh, chemistry, not only biology, but also history is the science that is affecting the future. Uh, especially what is important in my work, because I work as a historian, is that it is us historians who write books for university students, for secondary school students, and for elementary school pupils. And it is the knowledge that we share with, with those who come, and if we are successful in our work, uh, they will take our experience. Mm. Maybe that's enough for the beginning, thank you. Good, thank you, thank you very much. Um, the way we've tried to organize the panel is for each of the participants to express their 
core view as rapidly and as efficiently as possible. Then we'll move on to a second round where they will have an opportunity of commenting on each other's perspectives in respect of this, and then we will come directly to the audience. So that was an object lesson in how to get it exactly right. Lutz, can I come to you in the second instance? This is now um, Lutz Rathenau, the Commissioner for the Records of the State Security Service of the former GDR in the federal state of Saxony. Der, ich möchte Sie auch herzlich begrüßen. Der Antrieb, die Geschichte wissen zu wollen, die einen vorenthalten wurde in der DDR, war einer der wesentlichen Antriebe der Friedlichen Revolution 89-90. Die Stadtsicherheitsstellen in den 15 Bezirken der DDR wurden damals gestürmt, mehr oder weniger. Akten wurden illegal besichtigt, beschlagnahmt. Ich habe vor Weihnachten 1989 in Hunderten von Staatssicherheitsseiten geblättert und sie studiert mit anderen. Bevor Deutschland diese Behörde eingerichtet hat, die Stasi-Unterlagenbehörde, ein sehr kluges Konstrukt, mit vielen, vielen Unzulänglichkeiten, trotzdem funktioniert sie gut, fand ein wesentlicher Teil der Aufarbeitung schon statt. In dem Jahr 1990, in Büchern von Autoren, in Veröffentlichungen, in Zeitungen. Und getragen wurde das alles von der Sehnsucht und dem Willen, wissen zu wollen, was war um der Versuchung, Erinnerung zu verformen oder nur seinen bequemen Wünschen nachzugeben, auch wenigstens eine Realität auf einer Verschriftungsebene dagegen setzen oder ergänzen zu können. Ich habe heute sehr oft zu tun mit den verschiedenen Wünschen, Erwartungen, die mit Akten aus den Zeiten der DDR zu tun haben. Nicht nur mit Staatssicherheitsakten, auch mit Parteiakten, mit anderen Akten. Erstens um Repression, erlittenes Leid äh, bestätigen zu können, um Menschen zu Rentennachteilsausgleichszahlung, a German word, I think, äh, zu verhelfen oder äh, zur Rehabilitierung. Da gibt es verschiedene Wege und Modelle, es gibt sehr viel Unzufriedenheit, es gibt sehr unzulängliche Regelungen und es gibt sehr gute Regelungen. Das hängt damit zusammen, dass es nicht den politischen Gefangenen gab, sondern zu jeder Zeit in ein anderes, war er in ein anderes Umfeld eingebettet und in Ostdeutschland ist das natürlich immer eine deutsche Geschichte. In den Staatssicherheitsakten steht sehr viel über Westdeutsche, über Menschen, die in den Westen geflüchtet sind, die ausgereist sind, über Westdeutsche, die angeworben worden sind von der Staatssicherheit oder die illegal abgeschöpft worden sind. Das ist ein deutsch-deutsches Thema. Wenn man die Akten liest, hat man oft das Gefühl, man lebt in der DDR als Gesamtdeutscher im brutalen Zölibat der DDR-Existenz. Und die wissenschaftliche Forschung ist ganz wichtig, die muss dem helfen, Zusammenhänge herstellen. Deswegen geben wir zum Beispiel Schriftenreihen heraus und ich meine das jetzt nicht so als Werbung, ich lasse die aber hier im Goethe-Institut dann zum Lesen für Interessierte da. Das ist die brutale Zeit des stalinistischen Terrors, hingerichtet in Moskau. Das sind die Opfer, die manchmal keine Zeitzeugen mehr sein können, weil sie nicht mehr leben. Dann kam die Zeit der harten Urteile wegen politischer Lappalien oder echter Opposition in den 50er und 60er Jahren. 130 Jahre Zuchthaus für Schüler, Jugendwiderstand in der DDR wegen Flugblätter. Das ist die klassische politische Repression, die nicht mehr zum Tod, aber für viele Menschen zu äh, doch schrecklichen Folgen führte. In den 80er Jahren haben wir es mit Fällen zu tun, wie diesem 
Künstler, Jürgen Gottschalk, Druckstellen, die Zerstörung einer Künstlerbiografie, wo das deutsche Wort Zersetzungsmaßnahme beeinflussen einer Person, um sie fertig zu machen, ohne sie unbedingt ins Gefängnis zu bringen, sehr viel Leben bekam und sehr viele Menschen heute leiden lässt, ohne dass sie sich als politische Gefangene darstellen können. Und dann gibt es den Blick von oben, die Reisekater, wie Leute in den Westen reisten, in der DDR, das ist die Makroebene von ganz oben auf den Einzelnen. Und ein großes Problem oder eine ständige Herausforderung ist die Mikroebene der Biografie des einzelnen Menschen mit der Makroebene der Struktur der Verhältnisse zusammenzubringen sodass der eine nicht abstrakt über die Gefühle der anderen redet und der andere äh, ja auch erkennt, dass sein Fall nicht nur eben sein Fall ist, sondern in etwas eingebettet war. Und wir versuchen Recherchen zu fördern, die Fakten zutage fördern, die der Wissenschaft helfen und den Opfern helfen, beiden Seiten und der Publizistik und äh, mehreren anderen Erwartungsebene noch privaten biografischen Recherchen und diese Erwartungen sind nicht immer identisch. Die erzeugen ständig Konflikte. Thank, thank you very much um, for that uh, other illuminating perspective. Um, I, I think we're already getting a sense that the approaches that we have to take in this regard are layered and multifaceted. And as we started out by saying right at the beginning, there are no perfect answers. So we're in the process of learning. And Maria Schmidt, can I come to you next? Maria is the director of the House of Terror in Hungary. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. Uh, the first uh, freely elected uh, Hungarian parliament uh, after 1990 passed a law Uh, in which they wanted to punish uh, those perpetrators who, who killed, tortured the uh, political prisoners. But the Constitutional Court did not allow it. Uh, it said that the continuity of the legislation is more important uh, than the morally important question. So, uh, We, we were stalked in the mid-90s, and there was no way we could uh, begin to, to work on our uh, communist past. The uh, first Orban government between uh, 1998 and 2002 decided, therefore, that they will uh, uh, establish institutions and also the House of Terror Museum just to put on the wall for the whole Hungarian public the faces and the names of the perpetrators and also the victims. So uh, in 2002, we, we had the task to, to breach the, the, the monopoly of the leftist liberal uh, language narrative uh, explanation of the past, which they... they inherited from the communist past. They were in the position in the communist period to explain what happened in a 20th century, and they remained the, in the position until 2002. And then the establishment of the House of Terror Museum and also the institutions around the museum in the same foundation uh, uh, began to... to, to uh, to have a new language, a new narrative, and uh, began the first time, gave the opportunity to the people to tell their own past, their own story uh, freely, uh, and so that uh, uh, everyone could listen to it and, and could uh, see what happened uh, during the communist period. It was a, a great uh, fight, uh, and... Uh, But, but we won it, so. 
Thank you very much. These are, these are the most disciplined and efficient set of panelists that I've ever encountered anywhere. So this is deeply impressive. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, additional perspective. And Christoph Pezak, if I can come to you last in respect of this first round. Christoph is the director of the Office of the President of the Institute of National Remembrance in Poland. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, invitation. I'm privileged to be here in, in this panel and, and to share, um, well, our Polish perspective and some my personal thoughts as well. Uh, uh, well, if we are talking about dealing with the past or accounting with the dictatorial past or coming to terms uh, with, the, with, with the past of a non-democratic system or, or an oppressive system, uh, what, what does it mean? Uh, and is there any solution, universal solution, how to do that? I will straightly say there is no universal solution. There are different models uh, of, of, uh, of, of dealing with this problem, but there are very similar challenges that the society has to face, and I think there are at least two universal principles that should be uh, should be followed, and let me let me let me uh, comment on, on on that. I think that that the process of of dealing with the past, of overcoming the dictatorial past, is it's very complex and uh, multi-dimensional. I would I think I can I can point at least three such dimensions. The first one is the dimension of the public debate, revealing the past, and discussing the past, assessing the past and its consequences for, the, uh, for, for now and for the, for the future. And this, of course, is connected with uh, historical research and disseminating of knowledge about the, the dictatorship. Another dimension is a political dimension. It involves a change of the system. Uh, well, removing people of the old regime from politics and public life to some degree. There are different solutions for that in different countries. It involves opening archives, which is a precondition for studying the past, and creating relevant institutions that could, could, uh, could pursue this process. In Eastern Europe, we have such institutions which are often called the Institute of Memory. Two of them are, uh, have their official name, Institute of National Member Memory, which is the case in, in uh, Slovakia and in Poland. And the third dimension of the process of, of dealing with the dictatorial past is the legal dimension. This involves all, well, judicial tools like prosecuting the perpetrators of crimes of the past, uh, vetting the past of the people who hold public offices, depriving the people of the regime of undue privileges, uh, and so on and so on. Of, of course, rehabilitation and redressing the, to the victims of the, of the dictatorship. And as I said, there is no universal model. What model will be adopted, it depends very much on the nature of, it, on nature of a dictatorship, of the nature of a process of a transition, whether it was negotiated or revolutionary, and so on and so on. But I think the two principles should be followed. The principle of truth and the principle of justice. Justice done to the victims and justice done to the, uh, to the uh, perpetrators. And now let me just say a few words about the institutes of, of memory. Do we, do we really need the, these institutes? Uh, I think uh, yes and no. Some of these tasks can be, can be fulfilled without the institutes of memory. We have academia, we have, we have universities, we have other institutes that can do their historical research, for instance. It's, 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 there is a great role to be played by the civil society and non-government non organizations in uh, collecting the testimonies of victims with research, with publishing, with publish public debate, but there are some tasks which need some institutions. This is managing the archives, uh, prosecution of crimes, the process which is called, called illustration in Eastern Europe, Europe rehabilitation of, of the victims. 
Mm. In Eastern Europe, it happened so that the institutes of memory were are connected or were uh, established in order to administer the archives of the secret police. Uh, this is the case in, in, in mo I think, in most of the countries of Eastern Europe where such institutes uh, exist. Uh, and so it is very important that such institutes have some institutional guarantees of their independence, independence from the politics. Is it possible? Is it possible to, to create such guarantees? And is it possible to oppose or resist uh, uh, pressure from the politics? I think yes. There are some, some measures that should be taken. First of all, the, the, the appointment of the, of the authorities of these uh, institutions should be, should be non-political, uh, based on, uh, on, on, uh, on the criteria of the, of the knowledge of these people. This, these institutes should be, uh, should be uh, pluralist in terms of recruiting the personnel, and, and, so, and so on. And what is very important, such institutions should be very open to the outer world, to the academia, to the civil society, uh, to, the, uh, to the NGOs. They should not try or attempt to monopolize the research and the process of the, of the dealing with the past. So that's for the start. Thank you. Christoph, th <clears throat> thank you very much for yet another perspective, or set of perspectives in this case, on the nature of the challenge. I, I'd like to throw to all of you and come at, them in ex come at it in exactly the way that you feel most comfortable, three simple questions. The first one is, how does one get the balance right between redress for past wrongs, your principle of justice, and future orientation in terms of the reunification of the society around a single national identity that allows for constructive nation building and future progress. There are trade-offs and there is a balance. How does one get that right? Would you like to start, Manny? Well, <laughs> I will maybe again say it's, um, again, it is ne very necessary to realize that there is no, no state, no condition, no nation when everybody is content. So, uh, but the balance, balance, Balance is important for our institute, as you said. Thank you very much for what you said. Uh, and what does the balance mean for for us? Is a, it is a balance between you know having a a bit of political background, you know political support, and having a uh, and on the other other side we need to stick to professional rules, you know, to honor our profession and you know conduct the research in. In interaction with other institutions, institutes and universities, because <clears throat> it's absolutely not possible. You know, <laughs> I have to say what you said was completely right, uh, Dr. Pershak. You know, it's uh, absolutely not possible to monopolize anything. What is our advantage? Again, uh, we have the files of the former secret police, but there. These documents do not. Uh, there is always discussion if they are, if we are, we can use them to describe the past. We can use them to describe some of the past, and you know. <clears throat> uh, but we can use them to describe, let's say, a very important piece of the past. So, I guess there are rules that are established for centuries, you know, with the interaction and so on, and those rules that are uh, very good and are, you know, are completely enough, you know, for us to 
uh, to have our discussion about. Yeah. Thank you. Ich finde Historiker in dieser Debatte sehr, sehr wichtig und Genauigkeit in der Beschreibung dessen, was war, ermöglicht überhaupt zu verstehen, was Differenzen bedeutet und man kann sich erst versöhnen, eher ein theologischer Begriff, wenn man überhaupt weiß, was sich mit wem versöhnen soll. Die Worte Täter und Opfer sind so allgemein, es gibt verschiedene Arten von Täter. Ja, der Staatssicherheitsoffizier, der Hinrichtung oder Zersetzungsmaßnahmen plante, ist ein anderer als der, der für drei Jahre zum informellen Mitarbeiter erpresst wurde und Dinge gemacht hat, die anderen auch geschadet haben. Dann ist er auch eine Art Täter, aber eine andere Art. Und vielleicht dann wieder selbst zum Opfer geworden. Und insofern sind so abstrakte Debatten wenig hilfreich. Ich möchte, sie sind andererseits nötig. Ich möchte nur an eins erinnern. Die Wissenschaftler und die Aufarbeitungsbehörden werden diese Diskussion nicht allein bestimmen. In Deutschland gibt es ja mehrere. Da gibt es die Stiftung Aufarbeitung, unabhängig, macht eine sehr gute Arbeit. Die große Aktenauskunftsbehörde, die Überprüfung macht, die individuelle Auskünfte gibt, Wissenschaft, Erforschung macht, Öffentlichkeitsarbeit, Schularbeit, Ausstellung, alles arbeitet für sich, jede Abteilung, manchmal auch ein bisschen gegeneinander. Und es gibt die Landesbeauftragten und dann gibt es noch politische Stiftung, Stiftung politische Bildung und so weiter. Aber die entscheidenden Diskussionen angestoßen werden erstens von Kunstwerken, von Filmen, wie das Leben der Anderen, Jetzt ist wieder ein Hollywood-Streifen, Oscar auf der Oscar-Nominierung mit ostdeutscher und nationalsozialistischer Geschichte verknüpft. Und sie werden angestoßen von Journalisten, von Debatten. Interessanterweise in Ostdeutschland, das ist sicher ein Spezifikum, mit Themen, die Westbezug haben. Vergewaltigung von Minderjährigen, von Kindern in Erziehungseinrichtung der Kirche und es gibt eine anders geartete Heimkinderdebatte intensiv mit einem intensiven Heimkinderhilfsfonds unter ostdeutschen Kindern, wo das eine andere Art von Problem ist, mit anderen Ursachen. Das Thema Zwangsarbeit in Gefängnissen, Zwangsarbeit heute in der Welt in ostdeutschen Gefängnissen. Jetzt haben wir das Thema Pharmaziemissbrauch. Serien, westdeutsche Konzerne, nicht nur westdeutsche Konzerne haben in ostdeutschen Kliniken Testserien gemacht. Da ist genau zu gucken, ob das äh, wirklich immer äh, so schlimm äh, war. Äh, war es wahrscheinlich nicht, aber in einigen Fällen schon. Und diese Themen werden dann wiederum zu gesamtdeutschen Themen. Thanks very much. Maria, I'm, I, I'm going to put the two of you on the spot in the framework of this question in a particular way. Because unlike, in a certain sense, what happened in Czechoslovakia or in Germany, there is a sense in which both Hungary and Poland had negotiated transitions. There was a framework within which the transition took place. Now, the reason I'm putting you on the spot and asking you this question is that's exactly what happened in South Africa, where I come from. So I have some sense of the constraints implicit in negotiated transitions. And The question that I'm asking implicitly, so let me do it explicitly, is do you deal with that trade-off between justice and future orientation differently in the context of negotiated transitions? Or, as Maria was suggesting earlier, do you only delay the way in which you deal with the issue until a certain amount of time has passed and a different government is in power? I think that uh, the difference is uh, between Poland and uh, Hungary and all the other countries and Hungary is not uh, uh, because of uh, uh, negotiation, uh, enable transition and so on, but the, the terroristic period of the Hungarian communist past ended in the mid-60s. That was, that was, and, and uh, by the other countries, the, they went on until the end of the 80s. So that's, that's a big difference. So for the Hungarian 
people, the most terroristic thing happened in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and then the communists became much milder. So that, that's, that uh, allowed to the, to the socialists also to, to join us in condemning what happened because this generation of today socialist or today leftist are not engaged personally in that very, very uh, brutal crimes, which is not the case in Germany or in the Czech Republic or in the others. So that, that is one thing. The second thing is in Hungary that in 2002, with the establishment of the Terror House Museum, we put the whole question into the broader public because the language we used was understood by the school children, by the ordinary men, and it, it initiated a, a discussion which went on for years. So we began to, to discuss the past openly, and therefore we, we, we had another understanding of the past, and uh, the left also had to acknowledge what happened in, the, in this terroristic period. And therefore, uh, we had uh, over 4 million visitors since 2002. That means that every Hungarian came to see the museum once, and every school child, and so on. And that the, the museum is using the language of the youth. So they came in, they went through and say, oh, that's the first time it is not such a boring thing. I understand. And what we, what we achieved is, and that was uh, planned, and that was our, our main aim, to get their, their heart in the first place, and, as, and after it, their brain. We, it, because if you don't reach the heart of somebody, you cannot reach their brain. It's, it's, uh, it's not the understanding of Western Europe, because they, they don't like it. They, uh, the, the most uh, aggressive attacks, uh, what, we, what we got, came from Germany, only negative, negative uh, criticism, Austria. And uh, the most uh, positive things uh, from the United States, from England, Italy, Spain, and so on. So these, these countries, because they, they thought uh, uh, to, to, to try to get the people's feelings and emotions, that's, that's something very dangerous. And, and uh, uh, I have to tell you that our approach is also different because after 1990, the liberals established their, their institution for the, for the uh, research of the past, the 56 institution, and the socialists privatized the, the whole uh, party archive and uh, organized their own institution. So the, the right, the anti-communist side, had to establish their own institution in 2002. Uh, that is their problem, that the institutions are not so attractive. That's Thanks very much. And Christoph, how did Poland deal with this challenge? Yes, uh, first let me observe that we still don't have a terror house in Poland. We don't have such a museum like you have in Budapest. We don't even have such museums as you have in the former GDR, where there are museums in former arrests of, or prisons uh, showing the fate of the political prisoners. Uh, and uh, and to, to answer very directly what we are questioning, whether, what was the results of the negotiated change, uh, regarding the process of dealing with the past. I think in Poland it was, the result was the, the, um, that this process was delayed. It was not very much different. It is delayed. And we are delayed in many respects. First, our institutes of, Institute of Memory uh, was created, well, 10 years after the German Gauck Institute. And we opened the files of the secret police 10 years later. However, the party archive was opened immediately, which, which was very important, and it was the, the principal source for 10 years to describe, to describe the, uh, the, the system. I think 
that uh, now after opening the, the archives of secret police in, in Eastern Europe, the historians to some degree concentrate too much on this, this direction. So they are more interested with the perpetrators, actual perpetrators, not with those who gave orders. So this is, a, it's a kind of a mistake we are probably all making in Eastern Europe. But returning to the tension between uh, reconciliation and redress, you are asking about. There is such a tension, but I think, uh, I th well, it, it, it depends what, what you mean by redress. Let me, let me be more precise. Yes, redress, I mean justice to the perpetrators and compensation to the victims. Am I right? Yes. So, so I think there will be no reconciliation without redress. I think the redress is necessary for, re for true reconciliation. Be without redress, we will not have a true reconciliation. We will have oblivion. We will have a state of uh, neglecting the past. Uh, or, or, or putting this aside, but it will return. And we have clear examples. We have the Spanish experience, where they tried to, uh, to, uh, to forget about the dictatorial past for the sake of the reconciliation. And 30 years later, the new generation asked about the past, and, 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 and you, you know how, about this process, all, all of you. And uh, we have the Polish experience when we are delayed. Why we are delayed? I think there's another factor uh, which was uh, specific for Eastern Europe. Why some societies were delayed with dealing with, uh, with the dictatorial past in political terms. It's not only the matter that the, that the uh, transition was negotiated. Uh, it is also that transition met, meant not only the political change, but also a dramatic economic change. And this is what the politicians were most concerned with, how to deal with this economic change from socialist economy to market economy, and how to face and how to uh, uh, kind, some kind of solutions for all these social tensions. So this was what they, they were concerned first, and they, that's part of the answer, why they neglected uh, the, the process with dealing with the past and why we're delayed. But we have a good Czech example, for instance. I know that the Institute of Study of Totalitarian Regime was created quite late, but first you had a, an office within the Czech police, which was prosecuting the crimes of the, of the, of the communists. But you also did a very simple thing in, in the Czech Republic. There was created an institute of contemporary history within the Czech Institu Academy of Science. And this made a great difference compared to Poland. You had the whole institute that was concentrated with the, with the well, 20th century. That's what we lacked in Poland. We still don't have such an institute in Poland. Now the Institute of Mem National Memory parts a role of it, partly. But uh, so, so that's, well, let me stop here. Super. Thank you very much. Pavel, I'm going to come to the audience immediately after your response, so if I could ask you to be crisp about it. But you started with an extraordinarily important metaphor in respect of the synagogue that became a Protestant church, that became a cinema that was then left lying. And if one thinks of this whole process as essentially a process associated with some form of restitution, some form of redistribution, and some form of rewriting of history as a result of new exposures, then this balance that we're describing is intense. And I thought the point that you made extremely well right at the beginning was that this defines identity. But one's own definition of identity defines the approach that you're going to take to these questions. Would you like to elaborate on your thoughts on this? Well, yeah, so uh, the, the question you raised and uh, related to my story, I mean, the question was, do you need a process of reconciliation that leads to a national unity or 
a feeling of national identity. I think the process of reconciliation, and here I'm also drawing on, let's say, the European parallel, because huh? I've been thinking, well, for many years, uh, how, and, and, and this is an ongoing debate, what is the European citizen? I also work in the area of the European citizenship. Uh, how, how do you define the European citizen? How do you define the European citizenship, which is not based on the cultural identity or a national identity? What is it based on? And I think the question also uh, runs in parallel with what we are discussing here. Because I think the process of reconciliation that you definitely need should not lead to a uh, feeling of national identity, uh, but it should lead to a democratic society, a society which is inclusive, a society which is based on democratic values, a society that is pluralistic, society that allows a multi-perspective approach that does not uh, foster a certain only one political agenda, but that allows for a pluralistic debate, uh, which allows that debate, but, and that I have to say, uh, based on a certain values which are common to the whole community. But these values, I would argue, are not rooted in a culture, in a specific culture, natural, uh, uh, a specific nation, but they're universal values. Uh, we call them European values, the values for respect of human rights, uh, diversity, uh, rule of law, democracy in general. So I think whatever happens, and I think th this approach also defines the answer to a certain next state. Uh. No, thank you very much. I, I happen to agree with that last statement. I think that is the framework within which one needs to achieve the balance. Looking forward, you have to learn from the past, and you can only learn from the past if you expose the past. You have to find a measure of justice, a measure of redress, in such a way that people feel that the past has been responsibly dealt with. And then you have to find a way of moving forward based not on the victors writing the history, but on the principle of universal values that in fact give a perspective for the future that everyone will choose to identify with. We've got 30 minutes before we have to close the session, so there's plenty of time for all of you who've taken the trouble to be here today to make your contributions. Can I just ask that when you speak for the first time, do identify yourself and just indicate where you're from? Thomas, we know where you're from, but as you've got your hand up first, I'm going to hand the microphone to you. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, if you don't mind, I would... Uh turn the attention of the debate now to the uh, main motive that was behind um, us, the organizers of it. And that is um, the experience of you, yourself, and your countries with uh, establishment and in the end also the function of the institutes and institutions that you work for. Uh, my little theory behind this uh, debate is that it is actually not a very unique example what we are facing in the Czech Republic, that it is actually uh, quite natural that there are pressures and that are uh, forces and, and races uh, that are trying to uh, misuse the interpretation of past. And this belongs to the political fight, though what is important to say that we uh, need to keep it in the democratic uh, mountainals and we need to keep it within the public debate so that we are fully aware of what is actually happening with the interpretation of our past. So uh, if I may ask you, each single of you, for a very short answer, what was behind your institutions? What was the initiative? Who was the leading force that uh, led to the establishment of the institutes of the memory, of the national memory, in cases of Poland and, and, and Slovakia. Uh, what was behind the House of Terror? What was the basic initiative in the, in the past that led to, the, to its establishment? How was it in Germany? Um, and perhaps when was it? This is very interesting, at least for me and for my perspective. And again, I only want to underline that 
I am not very happy with what is happening in my country, but I feel it is, it is natural because of what is happening within the political scene and what is happening with um, those characters that were very active in the past and that are active right now. And this is, I believe, uh, very nicely expressed in the Economist article that I, that I was quoting from. Thank you. Thanks very much. You've got a real challenge now, because in order to give justice to the nature of this discussion, you're going to have to get the answer to that question into one paragraph. All right? We're going to start over here. <laughs> uh, it's really hard to do one paragraph. End of first paragraph. <laughs> well, uh, I, I'm trying not to repeat myself. Uh, the Polish politics in the 90s continued their principal division between the post solidarity part and post communist party part now it's much more differentiated but until the end of the 90s it was like that so it was the initiative of the post solidarity parties to create the institute and the main idea to create the institute was opening the files of the secret police to the victims that was behind the institute what came out of this idea is much wider. It is much, much wider. But this was the principal idea, and this, well, with some difficulties, generally worked. However, and what's surprising, the interests in Poland among the victims to see their own files is not very big. Uh, it's much, much smaller than in Eastern Germany when you have several million people who saw they are all fines, two or three million. Uh, in Poland, about 100,000. And the population of Poland was twice as big as the population of, big, of, of East Germany. And if you are asking about the political pressures and opposing them, I think the guarantees that I mentioned, which were applied in the Polish case, also worked. So in the Institute remained, I think, generally independent from from politics, mainly because the head of the institute is appointed directly by the parliament, and the candidate is not appointed by the politicians, but there is an open competition for this, uh, for this chair of the, of the institute. The reason why you were allowed a paragraph that was that long is because we are, after all, in the Goethe Institute. <laughs> <laughs> so the... the, the the main uh, uh, task of uh, the Terror House Museum was to show the Hungarian youth how terrific the, the co uh, communist past was, how lucky we are to live in a free and democratic society, and to take uh, away uh, the monopoly of telling the, uh, the history of the past from the left, from the communist hands. Wenn die BSTU nicht gegründet worden wäre, der Beschluss wurde 91 gefasst, ab 92 gab es die Akteneinsicht, wäre die Veröffentlichung der Staatssicherheitsakten privat, illegal, weiter erfolgt, denn es gab genügend Akten außerhalb dieser Behörde, die dann wieder, wir hoffen es mal, alle vollständig wieder zurückgeflossen sind. Es wären die Bürgerrechtsgruppen, hätten es nicht geduldet, dass diese Akten versperrt werden. Das war auch gar nicht möglich. Die Alternative stand nicht. Aber ich verstoße nochmal gegen die Zeitregel. Ich finde die europäische Komponente sehr, sehr wichtig. Das Hannah Arendt-Institut, ein Institut, Forschungsinstitut des Freistaats Sachsen, forscht gerade vergleichend, was war in Tschechien 1989 und der Slowakei und in Ostdeutschland. Es gibt Vergleiche, es könnte noch mehr geben zwischen Rumänien und der DDR. Es geht nicht um Nationalgeschichte damit neu zu schreiben, jedenfalls jetzt nicht so in Ostdeutschland, weil wir uns sowieso nicht als DDR-Geschichte neu schreiben werden. Und vielleicht auch gar nicht als Anti-DDR-Geschichte, das ist gar nicht nötig, sondern das ist eine Geschichte des Realkommunismus, das umfasste mehrere Länder, einige davon gibt es auch heute noch, in verschiedenen Varianten. 
Und äh, das ist, hat eine internationale europäische Komponente, die man nutzen kann, wenn man Erfahrungen vergleicht und darüber redet, Differenzen, Gemeinsamkeiten herausstellt. Das ist keine abgeschlossene Nationalgeschichte. Thank you very much, Lutz. And, uh, I, don't worry, I'm, I, I nearly did it myself. Okay, although in my previous, previous words I always stick to research now, I will not follow this model. <laughs> Because in my opinion, in Slovakia, uh, the reason why Nations Memory Institute was established was, I would say, more political. Uh, I know, I'm not really sure how Uh, how much do you know about the Slovak politics in the 1990s? But <clears throat> in my opinion, what was most important was that uh, in Slovakia, the illustration vetting law was not uh, no more valid after the Czechoslovak Federation broke or split. And we have uh, quite a large amount of scandals uh, somehow connected with the former secret police files And it is quite wide known that our former prime minister uh, at occasions found some files on his table and so on. So it was quite a bit funny. And what was even more, that our secret service held these files. Some people say that it was not uh, according to law. And I would say no. And they were not really willing to uh, allow anybody to see anything from that, you know, even from the 50s, even from the 40s, not at all. Even, it was complicated, even in such cases as was the beatification of one Slovak woman. And only after, <clears throat> let's say, a big pressure, they at least released the file so the process of beatification could be somehow carried. <laughs> so that was another point. And the third, third point I would like to mention is that uh, founder or the person that was behind our law, Jan Langosch, was very much uh, influenced by Germany and by Poland. So I would say three, three main um, sources. Good. Other questions? We can't all be stunned into silence. Good afternoon. I come from another part of the world. My name is Carlos Garcia. I'm the director of Radio and TV Marti. Um, th there is a change going on in Cuba right now. Um, and I'm listening to this panel and knowing the way that regime has behaved for the last 54 years. I'm afraid that if they start listening to all this and they know about it, opening files, um, you know, uh, re re I think you said redress um, was the word that for whatever reason that, that momentum might be lost. And, and that's just, I'm not, I'm here and I came to this panel because there's a lot of experts here. Um, what's your opinion about, about that, right? There's, there's movement, but it's been 54 years, a lot of crimes, a lot of human right violations, a lot of intelligence files have been, um, a lot of intelligence has been collected on citizens, on neighbors, family members. How do you reconcile that? How do, how do you project that to, to avoid this? Let's assume that there is some momentum for a change. Thank you. Who wants to take that one? It's a good question. Go on, be brave. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's, yeah. <laughs> It requires bravery to, to give some advice to Cubans <laughs> after so many years of the, of the dictatorship. Well, it's not after, it's still, still on. Uh, so, uh, and by the way, uh, in Poland we are at the same situation that we are uh, we're asked for help by the Tunisians who are also dealing with the past and, 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 and more institutes is going to organize some workshops in Tunis very soon. So, so, so we are asked about our experience and we can share our experience. I'm not sure we should give advice. Actually, uh, but what I think is important, what I think is important, that the people who suffered under the dictatorship need the feeling that justice is 
being made to them. That's and and this and the justice in this case is very multidimensional. Uh, that people, first of all, I think people need the, the truth, the right to, to learn their truth. Uh, they ha they can choose to do so. They can choose not to do so, but they need they require a right to learn about what the system did to them. I think they also need a feeling that justice is done to the perpetrators. It's not only punishing the perpetrators, just in, uh, make, uh, doing justice to them, but, but it's also a justice to victims that the perpetrators are punished. At, and of course, it's not possible to punish all the perpetrators. But the worst crimes should be should be should be prosecuted and uh, coming to compensations it is not possible to secure financial compensations to all the victims because it 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 it, it costs money and and no one has this money so but but i think what is important is at least some symbolic compensation to the to the victims, that their suffering is recognized, that their status of the victims or veterans is recognized, that they have a clear feeling that in the public sphere, it's, it's clearly said what was good, what was, what was bad. By the way, that is what we lacked in Poland in the 1990s, the clear axiology in respect to the, uh, to the past. And of course, some symbolic change, removing all the symbols of the regime, of the communist ideology. This is also important for, for the people. Anyone else want to break? Ich glaube, dass Akten nicht überall das Maß aller Dinge der Aufarbeitung sein werden. Wenn heute in afrikanischen Bürgerkriegen oder an anderen Orten der Welt schreckliche Dinge geschehen und Menschen zu Tausenden sterben, werden die Leute, die das verschulden, wahrscheinlich keine Akten darüber anlegen, vermute ich einmal. Die Rolle von dem, was diese Geheimdienstakten osteuropäischer Prägung im Realkommunismus darstellen, ist nicht auf jedes Gebiet in der Welt so übertragbar. Dort wird man heutige emanzipatorische oder Freiheitsbewegung nicht mit der künftigen Diskussion über Aktenerschließung befeuern können. Das ist mir völlig klar. Sondern man muss die Situation vor Ort ganz genau sehen, wie man Menschen konkret helfen kann, Ansprüche, Rechte durchzusetzen. Diese Akten helfen da, wo sie da sind, in tropischen Gegenden werden übrigens immer weniger Akten angelegt. Das Papier verschimmelt auch schneller heute. Bei EDV ist das wieder vielleicht was anderes. Da, wo Sie da sind, nutzen Sie einfach dieses Gerechtigkeitsempfinden, können Sie nutzen, dazu beizutragen. Ich muss in Ergänzung meines polnischen Kollegen doch auch noch einmal sagen, also in Deutschland ist, der Wunsch und die Forderung schon massiv, auch finanzielle Entschädigungen zu bekommen. Und die werden auch gezahlt. Wer ein halbes Jahr in Haft war, bekommt jeden Monat eine Rente von nicht selbst 250 Euro und die soll erhöht werden. Das werden die Parteien machen. Und für andere Formen gibt es Rentenausgleichszahlungen und anderes. Und das ist nicht ausreichend und ist ein Thema, was immer drängender wird. Die Zahl der Anträge auf Entschädigung nimmt zu. Die Zahl der Akteneinsichtsanträge ist so hoch wie noch nie. Die Wartezeit ist zwei Jahre, weil es 1.500 Mitarbeiter der Behörde nicht schaffen, das schneller zu arbeiten. Die Zahl der Beratung ist so drängend wie noch nie. Ich muss auch akute Suizidhilfe, Suizidverhinderungshilfe und anderes leisten. Erst jetzt beginnt dieses Thema für viele richtig brisant zu werden. Das wurde hier schon gesagt. Man war 20 Jahre damit beschäftigt, sofern man noch lebt, sich erst mal einzurichten in der neuen Gesellschaft. Well, 
I would like to just say that for me, I would say it's uh, very necessary to stick to rule of law at any cost because whenever you try to break the law, even you know having the best thing in mind, it will turn out somehow bad. So even if the bitter feelings stay, I think it's necessary not to, let's say, prosecute or or punish every perpetrator at any cost because we have we just have to stick to the rule of law. Can can I um, anticipate a portion of your question which I may not have been answered because the the principles that have been discussed are principles which apply ex post facto. And at that circumstance, I don't think that it's possible to disagree in any fashion. You have to get the balance right. You have to be able to demonstrate that justice has been served. You have to have dis appropriate levels of disclosure. And you have to have a values-based approach in respect of how you're going to move forward. I think those things are clear. If I understood your question, your question was, what will cause the, uh, let us call it the uh, post Fidel regime to continue the process of liberalization within the Cuban space if they believe they are going to be prosecuted historically based on 50 years of prior experience in this regard. And all I can tell you, and I'm saying this from the perspective of two things, one, I know what happened with the Cuban files and the GDR files in Angola, and two, I know what happened in the transition in South Africa. And what happens is that an awful lot of files get destroyed. So the underlying reality in those circumstances, when it appears that an end is in fact about to occur, which is one of the reasons why negotiated transitions are always more interesting in that regard, is that a lot of files tend to disappear out of the system quite efficiently. And the efficiency of the institutions concerned determines what extent of sanitization takes place in those frameworks. So I think you can expect realistically in the Cuban circumstance that there will be an attempt, if the process of liberalization continues and some form of transition is envisaged, that there will be an attempt to make sure that there isn't too much to work with uh, in respect of uh, um, subsequent redress. Thank you. Go ahead. Right. We have one back here. Can we get a microphone down here? Thank you very much. Hello, my name is uh, Karolina Kristanova, and I obviously never experienced the communist regime here in the Czech Republic where I'm from because I was born like two weeks before it ended. But um, I do have, you know, a long family history and stories have been told to me about how it was and how it wasn't and all that. And it just keeps being brought up every time there are elections here, people just discuss you know, the return of the communists and stuff. And now we have a saying, well, so how many percents will the communists get? Well, the communists from which party? So they kind of turned to get into each one of these parties, but that's what, not really what I wanted to say. Um, I wanted to say that it's not black and white, and when you kind of decide the fate of your perpetrators in Cuba, it, I think it's important to consider that some of the perpetrators may have been forced to do the bad stuff. And in us, sometimes in the Czech Republic, I feel like we're looking at black and white and we're punishing everybody. And we just kind of assume that everybody who worked with the circuit police is automatically guilty. And they have to go to court and they have to go through very expensive procedures in order to claim their name back. And some people who have been actually victims of the previous communist regime then became victims again of the new democratic regimes because the secret police had let files about them. And now when they wanted to enter their political career in the free democratic world, they couldn't because there were files of the secret police led about them. But how do you really want to trust the secret police of a communist regime? You know, so I don't know if you have an experience with that from Poland or Hungary. That would be really, uh, you know, interesting to hear. But there are people who, you know, have been victims and they're not really 
the perpetrators. So how do you distinguish this? Thank you. I think that's a really great question. Why don't you take it? As uh, Christoph told, uh, that's a real problem that we are stuck with this uh, with this question: who was a spy, who spied uh, the neighbor, and so on. What are in the secret police file? Files. That's not the main question. No, or the perpetrators are not only those who are in the secret police files. The perpetrators are those who instructed them to do that or those who got uh, got this uh, this uh, report and decided. And we are all uh, well aware, aware of the facts who were the member of the Politburo, the Central Committee member, and in different uh, places. And the intellectuals, let's, let's speak about it. They wrote the pieces, they wrote the books, they wrote the newspapers, they, they were in the TV, they explained us why is it good, why is it nice, why is it... Uh, morally okay, what what the whole system is about. So that that's also a very important point. Now the main the main important question, f uh, in in my understanding, is that the people uh, could could decide because I'm not uh, I don't like if somebody who did not live under a totalitarian regime began to explain at me. Uh, how it was and how it was not. It was difficult. It was difficult to everyone. Every day you had to decide whether you are on that side or on the other side. How you could uh, be uh, uh, not involved. What are the costs not being involved and so on. So if somebody uh, was a, for the freedom fighter is, is a clear situation. If somebody was a perpetrator, it's also a clear situation. But 90% of the society was not a perpetrator and was not a victim, only wanted to survive and keep their family. So I think every society has to decide also the Cuban society by their own situation and by their own uh, perpetrators and victims and give them those uh, 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 self-esteem what, what they deserve uh, going through uh, this kind of, of uh, persecution, what, what uh, we all experience in the totalitarian regime. But to, to, to put those people who somebody could find in the files uh, f uh, and uh, began to prosecute them, it's very dangerous. I'm not for the... For the, uh, for the written documents. I'm not a very big fan uh, 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 admirer of it because I think one can false uh, a document, one can put somebody in it. Those people who worked in the secret police also wanted to get some uh, more salary raise and so on. They, they, they made reports without any foundations. So, so I think we should be very, very careful on, on uh, working with this files on the secret police, you should uh, always uh, see it from different side, whether why, why is it there, why did you find it, and so on. It's, it's a much more complicated issue than we think that, okay, there are in the files. It's not so easy. It's does, does anyone disagree with that perspective? Where, yes, please. Ich bin nicht anderer Meinung, ich will sie nur ergänzen. Nach der Erfahrung des Aktenstudiums, zum Beispiel meiner 15.000 Seiten, die ich da so überblättert, zum Teil auch gelesen habe, kann man natürlich erstmal die Täter als Täter erkennen, die Offiziere der Staatssicherheit und mitunter andere Menschen, die benutzt wurden von ihnen, die nicht unbedingt als IMs registriert worden sind. Zum Beispiel auch in der Bundesrepublik, indem man Desinformation gezielt verbreitete. Das ist sehr raffiniert und da hat sie vollkommen recht. Man sollte das nicht so einfach eins für eins äh, nehmen, sondern man muss einen Kontext wie bei jeder Lektüre von jedem Schriftstücken herstellen und diese, diese internen Notizbücher der Macht, die eigentlich keine Akten sind, nur teilweise Akten, 
die sehr viel opulenter sind, wenn jemand 20 Seiten über ein zweistündiges Gespräch schreibt, handschriftlich, und versucht, die Psychologie des anderen zu durchdringen, da gibt er damit Dinge preis von sich, die würde ich jetzt nicht einfach nur in die Täter-Opfer-Schiene einpressen. Das ist in Deutschland bei allen Fehlern, die auch gemacht worden sind im Detail, auch nie gemacht worden. Es sind viele Lehrer, Lehrer geblieben. Es waren übrigens sehr wenig Lehrer im Grunde angeworben von der Stadtsicherheit. Die wurden über Partei und andere Dinge mobilisiert und diszipliniert. Und es ist falsch, das auf diese IM-Frage zu reduzieren. Das ist äh, sehr falsch, weil wesentliche Machteinflüsse auch der Stadtsicherheit in die Gesellschaft hinein außerhalb dieser IMs geschehen sind. Ja? Und dennoch ist es nicht uninteressant. Ich würde das äh, so sagen, ähm, dass 80 Prozent der Leute, die ich gelesen habe von den 80, 90, die auftauchen als sogenannte informelle Mitarbeiter, mir gegenüber, ich irgendwie unerheblich habe, fast verstanden habe und eigentlich schon beim Lesen alles erledigt ist. Bei 10 Prozent könnte man eine differenzierte Auseinandersetzung betreiben. Und bei den übrigen gibt es einige, wo ich sage, ja, also das ist eine Art von, das hat echt geschadet. Und wenn das jemand mehrfach systematisch gemacht hat, gab es sogar einige, da hat die Stadtsicherheit gebremst in den realen Auswirkungen dessen. Also wenn jemand schreibt in einem Bericht, ich schlage vor, den in die Psychiatrie einzuweisen, weil er beim Entzünden von Feuerwerkskörpern zu Silvester eher Züge eines Pyromanen zeigt. Da kann ich nur froh sein, dass ich nicht in der Sowjetunion der 30er Jahre war, sondern in einer, bei einer Geheimpolizei, die rationale Entscheidung treffen wollte auf ihren Gründen. Und solche Menschen sind dann natürlich nicht mehr strafrechtlich zu fassen, ist ja klar. Aber das ist schon eine Verantwortung, über die man auch reden, die man zumindest darstellen könnte, ob dann anonymisiert oder nicht. Darüber kann man wieder reden. Aber die Haupttäter sind die, die solche Pläne und solche Maßnahmen inspirierten und anregten. Das ist ganz klar. One of, the, one of the tragedies about that last proposition, of course, is the fact, I'm sorry, we're going to have to close now, but one, one of the tragedies of, of that last proposition is that very frequently what does happen in these transitions is that the people who give the orders, particularly the political orders, manage to deflect blame to the persons who received the orders and who then executed in respect of that. And I think that is yet another one of the tragedies of these particular circumstances. But unfortunately, I think that is part of the fallible human condition uh, of which we are all collectively guilty. I want to leave just one last thought in closing before I thank the panel. And that is the focus on the future in this regard. And I'm going to simply to move directly away from Central Europe and the areas that we've been discussing, although it's a bit closer to Cuba, unfortunately. So. But there are two quotes that I always think are very useful when thinking about how to move forward in this regard. The one comes out of the American Revolution, and it comes from Thomas Paine, who's obviously extremely well known. But Paine made the observation in his book, The Age of Reason, Those who expect to reap the blessings of freedom must, like men, undergo the fatigues of supporting it. Freedom doesn't come as a gift. Freedom has to be acquired and it has to be continuously fought for. And in the same vein, a very famous constitutional judge in the United States, Learned Hand, made an interesting observation about liberty. He said, what do we mean when we say that first of all we seek liberty? I often wonder whether we do not rest our hopes too much upon constitutions, upon laws, and upon courts. These are false hopes. Believe me, these are false hopes. Liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can save it. So that understanding that avoiding 
the errors of the past, the horrors of the past, the violations of rights of the past, can only be secured by ensuring that every one of you and every one of us is prepared to shoulder the burdens of ensuring that freedom and liberty define our futures is probably the most important lesson, I think, that we can learn from history. I think the panel have been absolutely splendid. I think your interactions have been excellent. And I'm delighted to have had the Cuban dimension thrown into it as well in the course of the discussions. Thank you once again to the Goethe Institute. And can I ask you to express your appreciation for the panel? Thank you.